How we doing? Y'all good? I'm great. Thank you for asking. Uh, it actually hasn't been, some of y'all are thinking, weren't you just here? And the answer was, is, it was a couple months ago. Y'all are going to have to start paying me. Y'all listen. Uh, Pastor Dustin uh, just prayed for me, but what I would love to do uh, before I get started is um, I would love to, to pray for you, and I would love to, to pray for him as well. Can we do that? God, I do thank you uh, so much for this amazing church, for this amazing group of people, and Lord, uh, people that uh, I pray for so often. God, I pray uh, for this body of believers. God, the church is so much more than uh, just a pastor, or just a staff. Uh, Lord, it's really about the people. And so I pray that you would just help for them to make a significant impact for you. Lord, that um, they would be missionaries wherever they go. And God, that they would change this city literally by their presence. And Lord, as they go to work, that they wouldn't just simply be going to work, but that they would be stepping into a mission field and they would see themselves as that. Uh, Lord, I do pray for Pastor Dustin. God, I thank you for his faithfulness. I thank you for um, the prayers that he prays for these people, and God, for the stories that he tells me, and God, for how he chases after you. God, would you just empower him? Would you bless him? Would you protect him, Lord, spiritually, physically, emotionally? And God, help for him to know that there's a crazy amount of people who have his back and support the vision that he has for this church. God, I pray for his family, uh, Lord, for Allison and the kids, Lord, that you would uh, help for that to be uh, that home to just be filled with peace. And God, for them to be blessed, God, for those kids to to be raised in this church and to become world changers as they, as they grow, to be spiritual leaders of their generation. And God, we thank you for who we are, who we are in you. And God, I pray uh, this morning very specifically that there would be a group of people who have their perspective changed on who they truly are. God, thank you that you're the only one who is worth um, our identity. You're the only one who is worth our life. And Lord, speak to us now. Holy Spirit, show up in a powerful way. In Jesus' name, amen. Today, I want to teach um, for the next few hours on this topic. Are you ready? Some of you are like, we came to the wrong church. Some of you are like, he made that joke that last time. I know I did, but some of y'all weren't here. I want to teach for just a few minutes, and this is my topic, me and my mirror, me and my mirror. How many of you would say that you have a love-hate relationship with your mirror? Some of you are like, there ain't no love, it's just hate. But I mean, but at the end of the day, you need your mirror, don't you? You, you need that mirror when you wake up in the morning, whether you like what you see or not, you need it so that you can fix your hair. Some of you forgot to do that this morning. You need, I'm just joking, y'all, like if he's talking about me. No, I'm not talking about you. You need it to, to do your makeup, which I don't do that, just so you know. But some of you, you need it to, to do your makeup. You need it to shave. I mean, you need your mirror. There's some things, the benefits to looking in your mirror. But what I know about us as humans is there's also a lot of things you dislike about this mirror. Because for so many of us, when we look in this mirror, we see all of the things that we don't like, don't we? We see the extra gray hairs that are popping up in our beard. We see the wrinkles that you could have sworn weren't there last night when you went to bed. Or maybe you see the extra few pounds that you've put on that came out of nowhere, right? I mean, it was just four donuts, come on. And so when so many of us, when we look into this mirror, we see things that, that we don't like to, to see. And oftentimes we let what we see in this mirror define who we really are. If I were to ask you today, and I didn't know you, but I were to ask you, who are you? First, most of you would give me your name. But right after that, I would nearly bet that most of you would tell me something about what you do. Maybe you would tell me your career, or you would tell me what job you have, or you would tell me that you're a grandparent, or you would tell me that you're a mom, or you would tell me that you're a dad, or maybe you would even tell me 
a hobby that you have. But most of us, when we think about who we are, we define ourselves based off of what we see in the mirror. And not just the external appearance either, but it's, it's about what we do, isn't it? We define ourselves by what we see in the mirror, about what we, what we do, by the insecurities that we've developed. We define ourselves based off of the external. Can I make a bold statement before I get too far into this today? Who you believe you are at your core is the most important decision you will ever make. Now, I know on the surface you're like, well, I'm not sure about that. But who you believe you are at the very core of your being, how you define yourself, how you truly define yourself when you look in the mirror is the single greatest decision you will ever make. And so many of us today are identifying ourselves by what we see in the mirror, not just the external, but it's the, it's the actions as well, right? It's, it's how we've behaved or it's how we feel like we're doing in the moment. But that's, that's dangerous. It's dangerous to define yourselves by what you do or by what you feel because if we define ourselves by how we feel in a moment, we're going to be subject to how we've done lately. Because if you went to bed last night and you had a good day yesterday and you wake up this morning and you look in the mirror, you're going to feel pretty good about yourself, right? On the other hand, if you had a rough day yesterday, if you cussed at your kids, I'm talking about somebody else. I know none of y'all do that. If you yelled at your kids, if you yelled at your spouse, if you did some things that you weren't proud of and you wake up the next morning and you look in that mirror, you're going to define yourself based off of how you feel that you did the day before. Your identity cannot be based in your actions or a feeling. And I know that flies in the face of some of what culture is telling us today, doesn't it? That we can identify as, or we can be whoever we feel like in the moment. And I came today to be bold and to tell somebody that you cannot hold your identity based on how you feel in a moment. Your identity is much more important than something that you feel like you are. It's so much bigger than what you do or what you feel in a moment. Paul, in the book of Romans, writes about a sort of mirror. Now, if you don't know much about the Bible, it's totally cool. I'll walk you through this passage, but The book of Romans is often considered Paul's gospel. It's where he gets really deep into what it means to have faith in Jesus and what Jesus has done. And in Romans 3, Paul is speaking to some Jewish believers, and he's trying to help them see themselves for who they are in Christ, not just what they see on the outside, not just what they perceive, not just what they do, not just how they feel, but who they really are in a relationship with Christ. And in verse 20 of Romans 3, he really doesn't make them feel good. Y'all listen to this. He says, for no one can ever be made right with God by doing what the law commands. In other words, you and I are usually busy doing something to try to earn the perfect reflection, to try to earn something to base our identity on. We're usually busy trying to do. So many people that I talk to live most of their adult lives trying to prove themselves to a bunch of people who don't care about them in the first place, trying to prove that they're good enough, trying to clean up enough, trying to look the part, trying to buy the stuff to prove to a group of people that they are someone important. We all, most of us, live with this idea that we have to prove ourselves. How many of you have young kids? Anybody? How many times, just, just estimation, estimation, how many times a day do you hear mommy, daddy, grandma, grandpa, look at this? Approximately 800? That's, that, that's the story in our house. We have, a, we have a nine-year-old. And the amount of times that I hear daddy, look at this. Mommy, look at this. Daddy, look at this. Daddy, see this. Daddy, watch this. Daddy, watch me do this. Why, why do the kids do that? Because they're looking for validation in what they did. The sad story in not just the world, world today, but also in the church, is that so many people have never graduated from the look at this attitude and the prove it attitude. For some of you, 
maybe you haven't graduated past this because when you were a kid, you didn't get that validation from the person that you respected, from the person that was supposed to love you. And so now you've lived your life in this constant need for validation to prove yourself, to prove your worth to the people around you. For some of you, maybe it started when you were a kid and maybe you didn't have a lot of friends and the only time you felt like you had friends was when you were doing something that they wanted you to do. Or maybe you grew up in a household of chaos and yelling and screaming and turmoil. And so you felt like in order to be the person you needed to be in your family, you had to keep everybody at peace. We got any peacekeepers in the room? For some of us, it wasn't when we were a kid. We graduated from it when we were a kid. But as we've gotten older into adult, adulthood, we've grasped this concept again of having to, to prove ourselves. Maybe you made a mistake. Maybe you made a mistake at one point in your adult life, and it was, it was a, a real mistake. It hurt a lot of people. It hurt your family. It hurt other people, other people's families. And so now you live with this mindset of, I have to prove myself to prove that that mistake isn't who I am. And so everywhere you go and everything you do, you always feel like you're, you got this innate thing inside of you, this deep desire to prove that that wasn't who you are, but you're better than that. For some of you, maybe you've been in a marriage or maybe you are in a marriage where the only time you felt pursued, the only time you felt loved, the only time you felt beautiful was when you were doing everything right, when you were giving off the, the right reflection to your spouse, when you looked the part, when you looked perfect. And so now you live with this attitude of I have to prove myself. For some of you, maybe you have a job and you feel like if you make one more mistake, you're going to lose that job and everything is going to fall apart. So many of us today are looking in the mirror, trying to prove ourselves to a bunch of people who don't care in the first place. We're trying to prove ourselves with what we have, with the car we drive, with the house we live in, with the persona that we give. We're trying to prove ourselves with the, with the job that we have. Some of us are even as sick as to try to prove ourselves by how our kids behave. And so we're stuck in this idea of trying to earn some sort of security to make us feel whole inside again. And so Paul is writing to these Jewish believers in Romans 3, and he's saying, you've been trying to prove yourself. It's the system you've been living in. You've been trying to keep the law. You've been trying to clean up everything. You've been trying to look the part, but it was never going to happen. You were never going to get what you deeply desire by trying to look the part. And then verse 20 he says, the rest of verse 20, he says, the law simply shows us how sinful we are. Well, that makes you feel good, don't it? Glad you came to church. The law simply shows us how sinful we are. But can, can you imagine just for a moment these people that he's writing to, these Jewish believers, the ones who have staken their entire identity on keeping this law. It started with the Ten Commandments, Right? Y'all remember Moses going on Mount Sinai, getting the Ten Commandments. Remember that didn't go well for the people at the bottom of the mountain. Y'all remember that whole story. But it didn't just end with Ten Commandments. They would add commandments and laws to those Ten Commandments. And at this point, these Jewish believers had been used to following over 60, or 600 laws. And so can you imagine the punch in the gut it is when Paul steps, on, steps up and says, you were never going to keep all of those laws. The standard was too high. Can you imagine how tough that truth is for them to grasp? The, the people who had staken their entire uh, identity, eternity, and relationship with God on making sure they looked the part. And Paul comes in and says, it was never going to happen. You were never going to be able to do enough. And I feel like somebody came in here this morning and God sent me here today to tell somebody that if you continue to search for your identity in what you see and you continue to try to prove yourself, you are going to die tired tired, worn out, and unaccomplished because you can't do enough. You can't clean up enough. You can't make a good enough, uh, enough good decisions. You can't do enough to earn the validation and security that you have so desired. You can't do enough to feel like you're enough. It's never going to happen. And so somebody this morning, God wants me to give you permission to stop trying, to stop trying 
to clean it all up and to stop trying to search for the security that you so deeply desire in all of the things that you've been looking for it in. You know, when you get into this mode of trying to prove yourself and trying to keep up and trying to make everybody happy, it really is a losing battle, isn't it? A couple of weeks ago, I was on my way out the door one morning heading to the office and I had my backpack and a bottle of water sitting on our little kitchen island. So I didn't realize that the actual strap of the backpack was kind of around the bottle of water. And so I was kind of in a hurry. So I went and I grabbed my backpack. And when I did, I pulled the bottle of water off in the floor, kind of happened in slow motion. You ever have those moments where it's like, no, well, it wouldn't have been a big deal except for the the cap wasn't on the bottle good. And so that bottle hit the floor, the cap popped off and water started pouring out. Well, I had to put my backpack down at this point, pick up the half empty bottle of of water now, put it back on the counter. And since I'm running late, I run over, I grab some paper towels off the counter. I pull the paper towels. The paper towel holder falls into the floor. As I'm pulling the paper towels, I unroll half of the roll of the paper towels. I see the water headed under the fridge. I'm like, I'm not moving that fridge today. I'm getting this before it heads under the fridge. I go, I wipe up all of the water. I throw those paper towels away. I go back, roll up the rest of the paper towels that I had unrolled accidentally because those things are expensive, y'all. I put it back on the kitchen counter. I turn around and I notice that there's some water still on the island. So I go, I grab a few more paper towels. I come, I try to wipe up the counter and the bottle falls off the island again. (laughs) Isn't that what it feels like when you are searching to be somebody, when you're searching for your security and trying to get it all right? and trying to impress enough people, and trying to keep enough people happy. Because what what I've noticed is I can get one thing right, something else messes up. I can make one group of people happy with me. Meanwhile, another group of people gets upset with me. And some of you today have been living most of your adult life in this hectic, chaotic motion of looking for your identity in all the wrong places. Paul is telling these Romans, you were never gonna be able to do it. You were never gonna be able to look good enough, to act good enough, to be good enough. And he tells them that wasn't even the point in the first place. The reason why God gave you those laws and the reason why you came up with these laws, it was never going to happen. The point of the law, the point of realizing there's something mistaken inside of you, the point of realizing that you are fallible and that you don't look the part, the whole point of that was for you to see that God is just, but also to seek another way. All of the stuff that you see when you look in the mirror in the morning, the imperfections, the hurt of the past, the broken relationships, the insecurity that you feel, all of that stuff isn't the point. The point of it is to point you to something better, something bigger, something more secure. And so Paul tells them all of this, and then he gives them some good news. Look at verse 21. It says, but now God has shown us a way to be made right with him without keeping the requirements of the law. Y'all should have shouted right there. I'll read it again. But now God has shown us a way to be made right with him without keeping the requirements of the law. As was promised in the writings of Moses and the prophets long ago, we are made right with God by placing our faith in Jesus Christ. And this is true for everyone who believes, no matter who you are. We're usually busy doing, proving. Jesus steps in and says, it's done. We're, we're usually busy trying to get it right, trying to create the correct reflection, trying to do what we think they want us to do, 
trying to look the part, and Jesus comes in and he says, no, I can fix all of this. You can base your identity on me and what I think of you. You can base your identity on who I am. You can base your future on me. And I want to tell you this morning, the only thing that is worthy of your identity and the only thing that is sufficient for you placing your identity, your security, and your hope in is the finished work of Jesus Christ, nothing else. The only thing that will sustain you, the only thing that will never feel like it's fleeting, the only thing that will ever make you feel like you are somebody is the finished work of Jesus, what he did when he stepped out of beautiful heaven onto dusty earth, lived a perfect life, died by his own will, rose from the dead three days later. That is the only thing because he says you're worth it. It's all. Jesus forgives us of all of the imperfections, and he gives us a new identity. Look at 2 Corinthians 5, 17. Most of you know this verse. It says, if anyone is in Christ, the new creation has come. The old is gone. The new is here. You see that thing you've been chasing, the perfection, the purpose, the why am I here the love from other people, the identity, it's only found in Jesus. And the reason why you have that desire inside of you for something more secure is to point you to the only one who is strong enough to hold your identity. So in Jesus, it's no longer about what you do. It's not even about who you are. It's about whose you are. Only one person gets to define his creation, and that is the creator. You see, the Bible gives us this beautiful picture. It's almost like when we surrender our lives to Jesus, it's almost like he sketches his name on our heart. I am... Um, like I said a minute ago, I have a nine-year-old nine boy, and I don't know why all of my illustrations today revolve around bottled water. But y'all have kids, and some of you are going to be like, no, this is my husband, who takes something out of the fridge to drink, takes two sips and sits it down, never to be heard from again. And so he got into this habit a year or so ago of taking a bottle of water out of the fridge, taking a couple of sips because he was thirsty in the moment, putting it down, and then never returning to it. He'd just go back and get another bottle of water out of the fridge. So me and my wife, we put our heads together. Okay, she thought of it. And we came up with a plan. We got that boy a Sharpie. So now, when we see a bottle of water sitting around that's had two sips out of it, we tell him, go get your Sharpie and write your name on it. Put it back in the fridge. Now, why do we do that? Two reasons. Number one, because kids are gross and I don't want to drink after him. Number two, because it tells anybody else that's going to be looking in that fridge, no, this belongs to Riley. Can I, can I tell you today that if you have a relationship with Jesus, and you may have forgotten this because I think we can sometime, can I tell you that what Jesus is saying about you is he's saying, no, this one belongs to me. He's saying, no, I have written my name on their heart. When they received me, when they surrendered their life to me, I have written their name on my heart. So death has no, no, has no place on him or her. Hell has no place on him or her. Devil, you can't touch him or her because my name is written on their heart. Jesus has written his name on the very soul of who you are, and the Bible says that nothing can take you out of his grasp. You are identified by the paid work of Jesus. Come on, somebody. And maybe my favorite thing about these verses is when Paul says, and this is true for you, no matter who you are. Because I, I, don't, I don't know about you, but sometimes I feel like so much of Scripture applies to everybody else but me. And it's not out of a prideful thing. It's out of a reflection thing. And so as, as a pastor, I can, I can counsel with people, and I can tell them how much God loves them. 
I can tell them how much, if they would just accept their identity in Jesus, how much it would change their life. I can tell them that. But when it comes to me, sometimes I have a hard time believing that God's that interested in me. But Paul says, this identity is for you no matter who you are. Can I tell you that in the kingdom of God, there is no rich or poor. There is no white collar or blue collar. There is no black, white, Hispanic, Asian. In the kingdom of God, we are all one with him because this message, this identity is true for you no matter who you are. And I say that because there are some people listening to me, whether it's online, and this, this video could have came online six months ago, but there are some people listening to me and you feel like you're disqualified from not having to look in the mirror and keep up and make everybody happy. You feel like you're disqualified because of something that's in your past, because of the mistake you made, because of the thoughts that go through your head, because of where you come from, because of the things that have been said about you and over you, and you think you're disqualified from all of that. But I want somebody to hear me say today, it's true for you. This identity is able to be grasped by you no matter who you are. Jesus is for everyone. You know, it's, it's interesting if you... If you if you really dive into Romans 3, the salvation that Paul is talking about here is justification by faith. I think sometimes we throw those words around in the church and we don't even know what they mean. Justification by faith is almost, you can think of it in a courtroom setting where you're standing before God, he's the judge, and you're guilty, but Jesus steps in and says, no, he's justified because he's put his faith in me. It's not to be confused with sanctification, which sanctification is, is a big word for walking with Jesus and becoming more like Jesus. And the reason why I bring that up is because one of the things that I've noticed about people is sometimes they'll refuse their identity in Jesus because they haven't been fully sanctified yet because they're not perfect, because when they still look in the mirror, even though they know that they are saved, they're secured, that Jesus loves them, that salvation is for them, when they look in the mirror, they still see some of those flaws. They still see some of those sins that keep popping up. They still see some of those insecurities that they deal with. And what will happen and what the enemy will do is he will convince you that you don't have the identity, that you're not justified because you're not sanctified. The justification, the salvation part, the identity part happens in an instant. And the sanctification happens over time. When you fully realize your identity in Jesus and what he's done for you and what he thinks about you, the sanctification, the walking with him, the surrendering to him, the becoming more like him, the getting rid of the sin, that will happen. But it starts with the justification. It starts with me identifying myself as a child of God and seeing the way that he sees me. And so Paul goes on to tell them this in verse 23. I'm running out of time, so I gotta talk fast. Y'all ready? Y'all listen fast. For everyone has sinned. We all fall short of God's glorious standard. Yet God in his grace freely makes us right in his sight. He did this through Christ Jesus when he freed us from the penalty of our sin. In other words, because of our identity, we're different. We're free. We're free from having to prove ourselves. We're free from having to clean it all up. We're free from the mirror identity that we've all held on to so long. We're free because of what Jesus has done for us. My Messiah is my mirror and he says I am his. My Messiah is my mirror and he says I am his. Y'all, when you get this, it changes everything. And then verse 25, it says, for God presented Jesus as a sacrifice for sin. People are made right with God when they believe that Jesus sacrificed his life, shedding his blood. When you see yourself secure in your relationship with Jesus, it really will change your life. I'm not saying it's gonna make your life perfect, but it will change what you think about yourself. It'll change how you judge other people. Because some of us, what we do is we look in the mirror 
and we notice the imperfections, and instead of doing anything about those, we reflect those onto other people. Because we think if we can look at them and we can see a bigger imperfection in them, it makes us feel better about ourselves. But when you grasp this idea that it doesn't matter what I see, it matters who Jesus is inside of me. When you get that, it changes literally everything. Your relationship with, with Jesus, your relationship with your family, your relationship with your kids, it literally changes everything. So how do you do it? Well, you have to look in the mirror in a new way. You see, I was getting ready for this message and I came across a, an article that talked about how mirrors actually work. And what it said was when, typically when you look in a mirror, it, it reverses everything, right? I mean, especially like if you hold up some text. Can y'all see that? Everything looks backwards. Some of you are like, yes, Jonathan, we've looked at things in a mirror before. But, so typically, the way I've always thought about it, because I haven't really thought about it, is that it just flips everything. But what I read about mirrors is, actually, that's not what happens at all, but especially when it's text like this, because we print on paper that you can see through a little bit. What it actually does is it reverses the text from the inside out. And so what I'm encouraging you to do this morning is to see yourself from the inside out. To look in the mirror and to see yourself the way Jesus sees you, which is not the mistakes, not the gray hairs, not the fact that I need a haircut right now. Sorry, mental note. None of that. When Jesus looks at you, he doesn't see this stuff. He sees you from the inside out. He sees his name sketched on your soul. And when you look in the mirror and you think about yourself, you can be secure and you can be safe in that. He wants you to see his mark on you, to see you the way he sees you, to walk in the one that he says you are, to think of yourself as a child of the most high God, to see yourself as forgiven and free and to see yourself in his eyes loved and secure. Jesus doesn't just clean me up. Jesus literally reverses my identity from the inside out. Come on. So let me make it really practical. I searched the Bible and there are no identity for dummies sections. It's not a heading in my Bible. It might be in yours, but I couldn't find it. But I do think God gave me a few things that can make this practical, can begin to change your mind because so much of this is, it, it's a heart thing, of course, but it starts in your mind. So we've got to re-engineer our minds when we think about ourselves. So here's just a few things. Number one, look in the mirror. Look in the mirror. Remember, the Jews were given the law. Paul says it was to show them how sinful they were. So it's okay to look in the mirror and to notice your imperfections, to notice your past, to notice the things that you hate about yourself, to notice the things that need to be corrected. It's okay, but most of us stop there. The second thing, the second thing is to look in the mirror again. Look in the mirror again, this time from the inside out. And so think about yourself. Pray through this. Ask God, God, would you help for me to see myself? Would you help for me to look at my identity the way you see me? Would you help for me to see how treasured I am? Would you help for me to see how loved I am? Would you help for me to see how secure I am? Would you help for me to see your grace? Would you help for me to see your power in my life and how your hand has guided me? Jesus, would you help for me to see myself the way you see me? And then the third thing is forgive yourself. You know, I think sometimes we can be better at forgiving other people than we can ourselves. But when you see your mistakes, and you see what Jesus thinks of and you accept that forgiveness and that identity, the third thing you've got to do is forgive yourself. And I don't, I don't mean to be crass. I don't mean to be a smart aleck this morning. 
But if the Savior of the world, the one who has always been, John 1, 1, in the beginning was the Word, and the Word was God. The one who created the expanse of the universe. If he says you're forgiven, who are you not to forgive yourself? Who are you? If he says, you're my child, who are you to deny it? And then the last thing is, let Jesus be your mirror as you seek and follow him. Let Jesus be your mirror as you seek and follow him. Because remember, justification happens in a moment. Sanctification happens over time. So as you look in that mirror the way that Jesus sees you, and you realize the fullness of what that is, the fullness of what that means for you on the inside, you're going to begin to notice some stuff that you need to change. You're going to begin to see, I don't like my temper. You see what normally we start, we start with the temper, right? But it starts with Jesus. It starts with the identity. So you're going you're gonna to begin to notice. He's going to begin to point things out. So you're going to notice, I don't like my temper. I do have a lust problem. I do have a greed issue. I do have a selfishness issue. I do have an anger issue. And as you realize what he's done for you and how secure you are, you're going to not be able to help but change yourself, walking in his power. You can bow your head and close your eyes just for a moment. I want to pray for some people today who have felt like for a long time that you've been missing your identity, that you don't even know who you are anymore. You try to cover it up. Men, you try to act confident but you feel like you're one mistake away. You feel like you're about to lose it all. And so you try to make yourself sound really smart or you try to appear a certain way or try to post those Instagram photos to make yourself look secure. But at the end of the day, you're still looking in a mirror and seeing nothing but mistakes. I wanna pray for you. I wanna declare some things over you today. God, I pray for the people who just resonated with with what I talked about. Jesus, I pray that right now in the stillness and the holiness of this moment, that you would whisper in their ear. Tell them that they are safe, that they are loved, that they are secure. God, I thank you that my identity is not based on what I've done or what I see in a mirror, but that I can make peace with that man in the mirror because of what you've written on my soul. Help for us to see ourselves from the inside out. If you're in the room this morning and you don't have a relationship with Jesus, that's the starting place. Maybe you've tried so many ways to gain that security, that peace that you've so desperately desired, but you keep messing it up. Let me tell you, you're always going to those of us in the room that have a relationship with Jesus, you could have been following Jesus for 50 years. You're still messing it up. I hate to tell you. But if you need a relationship with Jesus because you feel like you're always messing it up, he's not going to sanctify you. He's not going to perfect you in a moment. But in just a moment, when you surrender your life to him, he will quickly justify you and claim you as his own. So if you don't have a relationship with Jesus this morning, You can just pray this prayer. It's really more of a surrender. It's not even necessarily words to say. It's just a belief and a confession of a belief. You can say it in your head. You can say it out loud. We don't care, but you can say, Jesus, I need you. I need something secure. I know I've messed up. I know I've sinned, but I believe you are who you say you are. So right now, I ask you to come into my life. I surrender everything. Be the Lord of my life. I'm going to try my best to follow you so that you can make me more like you. But right now in this moment, I identify as your child. 
in Jesus' name. God, I thank you for the for the name, for your name that you've written on people's heart this morning. God, I thank you for the amazing privilege to speak to such an amazing group of people. God, I've done my best this morning in my fallible communication of this message. Holy Spirit, would you meet it? And would you teach your people with it? Would you impact their life? Would you secure them so that they can make peace with me and my mirror? It's in Jesus' name we pray. Amen.